Hello and welcome again for the second live panel discussion. We will have a great panel discussion with three panelists on the theme Infra Equity, being an infra investor in COVID times, along with our moderator that I will present in a couple of seconds. Let me remind you that you have great features on the platform, so do not hesitate to go and watch some panel discussions on demand, uh, the digital library also with podcasts, interviews, and of course, on this live session, like the others, you will be able to ask questions. So check out the box on the right-hand side of your screen. You will have an interactive discussion available for questions that we will actually tackle at the end of this panel. So let me introduce you to this panel. Uh, this panel about being an infra investor in COVID times will give us an insight from some selected infrastructure investor who have contributed to this M&A activity over the recent months. And to moderate this panel, please welcome Vincent Berry, who actually runs the infrastructure M&A practice within Natixis Partners in Paris. Vincent, the floor is yours. Thank you, Christina. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining this first of a kind Infra Web Day. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome three leading infrastructure investors that have strongly contributing, contributed to maintaining 
M&A activity and infrastructure at a very high level throughout the COVID crisis. Let me introduce uh, to, uh, you to them, Angelica Schesling. Uh, good morning, Angelica. Uh, your senior partner at Antin. Uh, you've personally led the acquisition of Babylou, the French nursery operator, and the sale of Initia in the, uh, the mental care operator, and also Antin has announced the reorganization of the capital of Eurofiber recently, as well as the critical acquisition of MIA in the water sector in Europe. Vincent Polica, good morning, your partner, uh, co-head of European infrastructure at KKR, also quite active during the COVID period with two jumbo transactions, the acquisition of Viridor in the UK, the investment in the last mile uh, network of Telecom Italia, and also you completed the sale of Deutsche Glasfaser uh, Glass just before uh, the lockdown in, uh, in Germany. Eventually, Jérôme Sousselier. Good morning, Jérôme. Thank you for being there. You're managing director at ICG for infrastructure equity and you have personally led the third investment of uh, ICG in infrastructure uh, within the French renewable developer CVE uh, recently. So thank you very much again, and purpose of this panel is to have Angelica, Vincent, and Jerome uh, first backward and prospective look at what it means to be an infrastructure investor uh, during the COVID uh, exceptional times. Our discussion will be articulated around three times. First, the challenges faced by our panelists in monitoring, managing the existing portfolio of infrastructure assets. Second, the rationale for, and challenges for further investing or rotating assets during this very period, as well as the potential amendments implemented to their um, investment policy in those very times. And third, the new trends and opportunities that the current cri crisis may trigger or accelerate. Let's start with our first topic, monitoring the existing. And my first question is for you, Angelica. Uh, again, good morning. Angelica Antin has rapidly become one of the leading uh, infrastructure firms in Europe, but also globally, with an impressive growth story. Having said that, it is fair to say that Antin faces today its first severe external crisis. To what exchange this challenge uh, has required Antin to adapt its day-to-day -day operations? Have you experienced at this occasion a deepening of your relationship with uh, the management teams within your participation? And have you developed a new set of expertise that in the future you will be able to promote to new uh, management teams? Oh, that's a that's a lot of questions. Yeah. Um, I mean, but just uh, starting maybe with the first one, if I may, it's not the first crisis we're seeing. It's actually the second, uh, if you so will, because we raised and invested, well, half invested our first fund in the middle of the um, a great financial crisis. So, so we're not new to crisis uh, in that sense. Um, and I think it's fair to say that a seasoned investor needs to be able to invest throughout, you know, different investment horizons. Although I admit that, you know, a pandemic is, is, is rather peculiar uh, uh, with three billion people at home uh, and various implications. Now, it's, uh, regarding your question, our day-to-day -day operations, I mean, luckily, I have to say we were set up for home office. We weren't set up for home office because we are thinking about home office. We're set up for home office because we are traveling a lot. Uh, we have, as you pointed out, a pan-European mandate out of uh, Paris and London, and we're active in North America with our U.S. office. So most of the partners are on the road, like, all the time under normal circumstances. So I guess, you know, working remotely is, 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 is something that's quite key. Um, now, what we didn't know is that we could all work remotely at the same time and work just fine. So that was a, a, a new experience and also a new experience working with our management teams. Um, 
I think in terms of maybe your second question regarding our relationship with management teams, I think it was to my mind really the hardcore test um, of the quality of the teams um, with regards to you know our portfolio companies. I thought we had really good teams, but you know crisis you know chose reality. Do you think you have good teams or do you really have them? They all had the right instincts putting in crisis cells like already, you know, end of January, February to prepare for what might be coming up. Um, and so, you know, I feel quite privileged and happy that they've been able to work through this, uh, you know, in a very, in a, in a very good, good manner. So I think when it comes to how do we react, I think it's, again, kind of a hardcore test in terms of a shareholder and how supportive is a shareholder. Um, of course, we did what I'm presuming most people would do, i.e. start running stress tests, understanding, you know, as a function of how long a, lock, a lockdown would last, what is the impact, what's the impact on the cash position, uh, you know, do we need to uh, do we need to prepare for really bad times? I mean, we got lucky. It was for given that we're infrastructure investors, our assets proved to be very resilient, and so we didn't have to intervene in the end in any of our assets. But we prepared, and we ran a lot of stress tests, in particular in March. Excellent. Thank you, Angelica. Uh, Vincent, a uh, question for you on the same topic. Uh, can you please elaborate on how you've been able to leverage all, over the past month on the long-dated private equity track record of KKR and then uh, a, a, a great experience in managing a severe external crisis to cushion the blow uh, on your participation? And can you describe the main challenges you have been faced with uh, over this very period? Yeah, um, I would say the good thing about being KKR, and, and you alluded to that, is you know we have been around for 44 years uh, at a, as a private investor, and so it is not the first crisis, or the second for that matter. Uh, unfortunately, we had to go through a lot of those uh, over time, and there is a lot of muscle memory, frankly, that the organization has built, has built around that. Um, you know, in a situation like that, there is a clear playbook at KKR, and we always focus on three things. The first one is really liquidity. Um, you know, companies uh, survive or die because of cash. It's as simple as that. So liquidity is always uh, the first area of focus. Um, second, you look for help, um, and, and looking for help is outside help, but you have to be very thoughtful about the outside help you get. Uh, and we have seen that in this crisis, I think outside help can come with a lot of strings attached, so you really have to understand that. Uh, and so the, the, the best help you get, frankly, is self-help in situations like that. So, you know, looking at your business, where can you uh, help yourself? Where can you save cash? Where can you take actions very quickly uh, that will help you go through the crisis? And when you have done those two things, the liquidity and the help, uh, and you have played, you know, defense, as my U.S. colleagues uh, like to say, you also focus then on the offense. If you feel, you know, your business is in a good place, uh, then you really try to start looking at what can I do out of that crisis? Are there opportunities uh, that, that we fall from that? So that's that's really the playbook. Now, the, the good thing, again, about, about a place like KKI is that in a situation like that, you have a lot of people uh, and, and a lot of things that can help you. Uh, first, we have a lot of teams and resources internally. Um, you know, we have a macro team. Those guys spend all their time thinking about what is happening next to the economy. Uh, we have a public affairs team who is really the plug the connection to uh, public stakeholders, and that's critical in a phase like that. And then obviously we have a big capital markets team that really helps us navigate the uh, you know the liability and the financing side of things. So that's you know all the teams that you can leverage internally. Uh, the, the other good thing, frankly, is that as KKR we are we are everywhere. We are across all regions. We are across or sectors, and we are frankly across the entire capital structure, equity, you know, debt, and, and anything in between. And the amount of knowledge, the amount of understanding you get of, of what is happening, you know, frankly, sitting in Europe and understanding what happened in Asia, uh, and then our U.S. colleagues, frankly, benefited from the experience of the other two regions, uh, is something that is that is super valuable. You know, when it comes to challenges and, and really focusing on, on on European infrastructure business. 
the truth is, luckily, we had we had very few challenges, and this is really back back to the risk kind of based approach that we have in infrastructure. When we started that business ten years ago, the focus was on on risk and and investing in assets which have low risk. And, and low risk really means two things. It means the business risk of the assets in which you invest, and it also means capital structure. And so we were in a situation where, from a capital structure standpoint, we had already pre-COVID taken all the action, refinanced every company we had uh, with you know very attractive debt packages, no covenants, and, and what have you. And so we had absolutely zero issues on, on, on the financing side and nothing to worry about on that side. And then from a business standpoint, and I simplify a bit, but if you look in the last 10 years where we have been investing, and I'm sure we will talk a lot more about it, this was really in two sectors. One is everything that has to do with energy transition, uh, and the other thing is everything that has to do with digital. Uh, and, and what we have experienced is those two sectors have been little to no impacted by this crisis. And so, so from a business standpoint, we were in a very good spot. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, on this uh, first topic, a question for you three. I think you will all confirm uh, the superior resilience of infrastructure as an asset class relatively to the other. Uh, two questions for you. Um, your three institutions are uh, very big in the fiber sector. It was the inaugural investment for ICG. Antin, KKR, you are very strong. Is it fair to say that ultimately fiber telecoms will be the ultimate winning subsector in infrastructure out of this crisis? And second question, have you changed your long-term approach uh, to investment allocations according to the various infrastructure subsectors? Uh, let's start with Jerome on this one. So will fiber be the ultimate winning uh, subsector? Uh, I think telecom, you're right, digital is coming very well out of this uh, crisis. Uh, working from home has helped, obviously, but also we, we can all see the, you know, the trends that are, that are happening. I think uh, Vincent alluded also to energy transition. I think this is also uh, an interesting one where we see an acceleration uh, in terms of renewables, um, but other uh, sub-themes. So, you know, which one will be the, the winning one? <laughs> I think you know both can really coexist because there are two uh, two very powerful trends, uh, you know, uh, happening in infrastructure market. Uh, and yes, they happen to be incredibly uh, resilient. Uh, I think you're right on that. Uh, on fiber, yes, we see you know uh, data accelerations. When I look you know at our first investment, we actually saw uh, the take ups in number of uh, homes activated on the network uh, increase uh, throughout the crisis as people work from home. We see. Also increased data usage, uh, you know, higher VOD. But you can see that the trends are accelerating uh, from that respect. On on your on your question about you know long-term uh, investment allocation, a uh, tricky one because obviously you know transport is um, is a sector that has been uh, impacted with the obvious one uh, being airports. But you also have you will also have mobility needs um, where there's still a lot of. Uh, investments required uh, if you look you know at aging rolling stocks uh, for example but you can take a few other subsectors uh, so on our end ICG yeah, we're you know fortunate that you know our first three investments were have been also in telecom and energy transition so we're, we have not been impacted by uh, transports uh, issues uh, I think the way we see it is we're on pause and we are indeed uh, reflecting a bit on what's happening and would we be long-term underweight in transport? Uh, it's probably a bit too early to say. I would say probably. Um, but to be seen on a case-by-case -case basis, you know, we'd look at very specific assets within that space to see that they have, you know, the resilient characteristics that we would want to see. Thank you. Angelica, on the same topic, your, your personal views? Yeah, sure. I mean, to be honest, uh, my view... You know, Fiverr was a winner long before the crisis. And, you know, I, I'd love to say, well, we invested into Fiverr because we saw COVID coming, but quite frankly, <laughs> not, not really uh, the case. I, I don't think anybody saw this coming um, or very, very few people in any event. Um, why did we invest into Fiverr? We invested into Fiverr because Fiverr, because we're in, a, in an industrial revolution. Um, we're at a point in time where we're 
a new infrastructure is being implemented and has been implemented for a few years, depending on the jurisdiction and the country and the politics and the incentives. Um, and it's a, it's a piece of infrastructure that everybody needs. Um, it's a piece of infrastructure that will be there for the long term. Um, and it's because of that that fiber has been a, a winner in the first place. Um, and I think COVID obviously accelerated that, as it has accelerated the decline of other sectors, most notably, you know, some subsectors of retail um, and so on and so forth. So I do think that COVID has um, has accelerated certain, you know, kind of movements that were already going on. If you think about so kind of a shift in appetite, I guess, in my mind, the big winners are solely fiber and telecom infrastructure, but it's also healthcare. I think people understand the importance of the sector and of certain subsectors much better as an essential service for the society. Um, and equally, you know, other sectors that have been very much, you know, at the kind of desire of, you know, in particular, longer term, like pension funds, like airports, have suddenly proved to be a lot less resilient than what, you know, the, the common wisdom uh, might have been. Does that necessarily change our investment allocation at Antin? Um, you know, we basically had a strategy which is unchanged uh, since inception. I don't think we'll be changing it. Um, and so we'll continue to, to construct a, a well-balanced uh, portfolio across, across all core sectors, but what is sure, it does increase the appetite for certain subsectors. Thank you. Vincent, something to add? Um, very quickly, you know, quite, quite similar views. I talked about our risk-based approach, uh, you know, and risk-based for us meant how correlated in the end is a business to the economic cycle, to the flows of, of people and, and goods, you know, barriers to entry, how, how indispensable is a particular asset, you know, and I think what we saw in that crisis is, you know, whatever happens, you need electricity at home and, and ways to produce it, whatever happens, you need you know, you need telecom infrastructure that these days, you don't actually need to travel, right? Uh, and so, and I completely agree with Angelica, we're not gonna pretend we saw COVID coming, but certainly when we defined the strategy 10 years ago and this risk-based approach, we have those criteria. And what that meant is that in many, many cases, you know, the transportation infrastructure in particular didn't meet that test. And so in over 10 years, it's not by accident, we haven't, never invested in an airport, never invested in a port, never invested in a toll road. And if you look at our portfolio, we have been massively underweight transport, you know, equal weight, I would say energy utilities, but with this focus on energy transition I was mentioning and, and massively overweight telecom. You know, today, if you look at a European portfolio, 11 investments, nine of 11 are in those two buckets, energy transition and telecom. And, and this crisis for us, you know, in the end, you know, in a way we hadn't been tested for 10 years and we all said the same, you know, we are super resilient and, and don't self protected, but now the test came and, you know, we, um, we saw what, what really that, that meant for people's portfolios and we certainly feel vindicated in our strategy. And, you know, as, as the Americans would say, you know, if it ain't broken, don't fix it, right? So that's really what we feel about our business going forward. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, let's move to our second topic, which is investing and further retaining assets in your portfolio in this, uh, in this crisis. First question for you, Angelica. You were uh, f mentioning a, a few minutes ago uh, social infrastructure. Fair to say you're one of the most active player in social infrastructure with an impressive portfolio. Uh, Almaviva, Amedes, Babilou, Inisea, Hesle, Kissimu. Uh, in the current health crisis, in the current health crisis, definitely, uh, we see that this sector is in the front line. Um, it is critical as an essential service, and in case of a disruption, we all, we have all experienced the impact on our day-to-day -day life and the economy. The crisis also has also evidenced the need for additional investment going forward, and the private investors will be absolutely key in that perspective. Uh, 
but equally, risk seems major uh, in terms of health, in terms of reputation, uh, with an increased need for protocols, regulation, due diligence. Uh, can you elaborate on how your investment approach to this key sector has evolved over the past month? And have you adjusted or do you expect to adjust your own overall investment process with new criteria in the light, uh, in the light of this uh, current uh, crisis? I, I mean, look, infrastructure investing is about you know, investing into essential assets for the society. So by definition, you're investing into something that's crucial and you're investing into something that needs to work. Uh, very often you're investing into something where health and safety is, health and safety is a, is a big concern. If you think about ports, airports, you know, any sort of kind of more industrial uh, uh, infrastructure, um, and if I look at, say, you know, one of our investments we've done in, G in the energy front, at one point in time, we used to uh, import about 20% of the UK's gas demand. So let's talk about a reputational crisis when, <laughs> when our offshore pipeline wouldn't have worked. So I think really, you know, what you see in healthcare is no different, or in healthcare infrastructure, I shall say, um, it is no different than what you see in, in other infrastructure assets. I think infrastructure investors have an even heightened uh, amount of duty of care uh, because they are dealing and investing in very critical assets uh, and companies. Um, and healthcare is, is really no, uh, no exception. Um, uh, you described it as being on the front line critical um, and needing additional investment, I think that would also be true for many of our infrastructure investments, regardless of the subsector. Uh, what, what I may add, maybe when it comes to uh, healthcare and education, it's these are sectors that are, I would say, at least in you know Western Europe and other jurisdictions, very heavily regulated, and they're very heavily regulated in terms of quality protocols. They're very heavily regulated in terms of, you know, education of the people who can actually, you know, work uh, in these sectors. Um, and as such, I think that the, the government frameworks that are presented, at least in the countries where we would invest into them, um, you know, are already very strong and are quite, you know, comparable in a, in a certain sense to uh, other infrastructure sectors. Um, so just to finalize, maybe I think infrastructure investing is always uh, goes always alongside with a heightened attention to reputational issues. Thank you, Angelica. Jerome, one question for you. Uh, as individual within uh, ICG, you all have a long dated track record of, uh, of investors, but as a new team, uh, you, you, you are a new entrant in, the, in this infra space. Uh, how do you see uh, this particular moment? Is it for you, um, it adds complexity uh, for you to find your way through in a very crowded market, very competitive, where, in the, where there is already a scarcity of uh, opportunities compared to the money to be deployed? Or for you, is it an opportunity because some of the more established infrastructure funds may be tempted to make a pause in the investment process? Yeah, also a few questions. Um, I think, you know, when we look at the period, uh, yes, I mean, challenging, uh, for sure. I mean, I'm sure everyone, you know, uh, you know, at personal levels, professional levels, uh, but also for us, I mean, you're, I mean, ICG has been investing for 30 years, and as a team, we've been also doing that for many years. So uh, when I look at other times, I think it's also, you know, I think a lot of opportunities. Uh, yes, we are, you know, our fund, we're deploying the fund, so it's still a lot of dry powder. So it's an exciting moment, actually, to uh, to invest, and we're very, very busy. But you know, to your point about competition, and indeed, there is a lot of dry powder in the market. Uh, the reality that we see uh, currently is, you know, we focus mostly on working with corporates. You know, I would say, you know, in the lower uh, mid-market, we focus on much smaller transactions. Um, 
some of my esteemed colleagues. So, and in particular with corporates who, if anything, now need uh, cash, uh, or you know, a lot of the European corporates are lo now looking at their uh, portfolios, reassessing what is you know a, a core asset for them, uh, whether they need to reshuffle their portfolios and bring on either a minority investor or sell or sell uh, some businesses. So we see you know in the dialogues that we are having with now some of our uh, you know corporate relationships, we see quite a lot of activity actually which came a bit as a surprise that it would come so early. You know, when we looked at historically at other crises, typically it does take a bit of time uh, for people to adapt a bit to, to this, I don't know if it's a new world, but this changing environment. And we see, you know, these discussions accelerating. And you can actually see also in, in the wider market uh, some large M&A transactions going back. So, yeah, now, frankly, we see actually uh, quite a lot of opportunities for us um, in the sectors and, and with the corporates that we work with. Thank you, Jerome. Uh, turning to you, Vincent, uh, the words of your CEO in May this year are still resonating to me. Uh, he said, we will use this crisis to grow aggressively, explicitly referring uh, to an increased use of your impressive balance sheet as a differentiating factor and also pointing out at uh, crisis time as the moment to be on the ground in order to foster development. Can you elaborate on your strategy and uh, what is deemed to change in practical terms in the, in the, in the, in the short term? Yeah, no, I, I, I think if you, you know, if you look at the history of, of KKR and, you know, we, we obviously pride ourselves on being, on being smart money, but the reality is, if you look at again, you know, when when we spend capital over time, we used to be fairly procyclical in the way we do that, and and frankly, being procyclical is is not that smart. Uh, now, in fairness, um, you know, to be to be countercyclical, you need to have obviously the brains, you need to have the conviction to do that, but you also need to have access to the capital at the time at the time you need it, uh, and that was frankly historically part part of the issue on on the equity and on the debt. Now. All that really changed in, in the last years for us, um, you know, started with the IPO and then as you as you alluded to, uh, the fact that we really build the balance sheet in a very, very meaningful fashion uh, over the last 10 years, really. So today we have a balance sheet with, you know, 15, 20 billion of equity and at any point in time, you know, several billions of cash. And that is a, a, a very powerful tool and, and we have seen that this year. We have been doing between March and, and September in, in infrastructure in Europe alone, we have invested over 5 billion of equity, uh, three investments, two of those investments, one of, of, of 2 billion. Uh, and we could only do that because of this balance sheet and the ability we have to uh, underwrite transactions, uh, you know, speak for the entire equity as, as KKR. And then in the second stage, we can then turn around and you know, syndicate that equity as, as co-investment to our NPs. Um, and that is, as you can imagine, in, in a situation like the one we had to go through is, is very powerful because it gives you speed, gives your counterparties transaction certainty, they know that they have one party to talk to, uh, and they know that that party will show up you know, at the time of closing with, with, with the money to, to do the deal. Uh, that, that was absolutely critical. Uh, that put us in the position to do all those investments this year. Uh, and, and that made us, um, you know, I would argue one of the most active, if not the most active investor in, in the space in that time. Um, and that is true, by the way, for infrastructure, but that is true for all the other asset classes. I think if you look at private equity, real estate, uh, credit, and all the others, uh, I, I believe we have been the most active alternative manager since, since the beginning. Thank you, Vincent. A question for, for you three. Uh, to conclude on this second topic, we are living for many years now in a, a market that is definitely sellers oriented. Um, do you see in the current crisis some uh, kind of a rebalancing between buyers and, uh, and, and sellers? Uh, for instance, with an increased weighting ascribed to qualitative criteria in the selection of a buyer? And another question, when the time are difficult, like the, the one we are experiencing, is, is it still the good time to contemplate a rotating assets uh, within your portfolio? Uh, perhaps I will ask first my question to Angelica, because Angelica has been active both sides, either on the sell side and buy side recently in the, in the social sector. <laughs> Look, 
I would say an, an experienced professional investor needs to be able to buy and sell at the same time and go through the go through the uh, go through the ups and downs that a market may or may not um, exhibit. Um, you know, I think we were very lucky having had the opportunity to partner with the Carl family on Babylou and yeah, you know, it's a deal that was coming out and it's a deal that we've been following for three years. We were very comfortable with the, uh, with the founding uh, family shareholders who would stay. Um, and so we did this add-on, this acquisition, sorry. The same is true for the acquisition we did in the water sector, which is basically a, a partnership with a, an existing management team in a sector that we feel to be quite resilient. Um, so we're very pleased about those two add-ons we did uh, effectively over the summer. Um, in terms of um, selling assets, um, so we got approached by a strategic for one of our assets um, with a very high interest level, um, and um, and so so we we looked into this very seriously, and on the the final um, situation, a reorganization of a capital structure that was driven by a need of additional add-on capital to grow. Uh, we've talked a lot about um, about fiber, and we are very pleased um, about the, uh, about doing this transaction because it just allows the company to further develop, you know, at the rapid pace it has been been doing over the last years. Thank you, Angelica. So, for situations, uh, okay. for a little bit different ways of of looking at things, um, but you know. I think it's it's for me it's a it's a detriment to the to the resilience of the infrastructure world. Thank you, Angelica. Jerome, your views? Yeah, you mentioned rebalancing. It's an interesting word. Um, I think uh, we're seeing two things. I mean, you know, in terms of the deals that we're looking at. First, um, in terms of sectors, I think clearly on the transport side you see less activity. No surprise to to anyone. Um, how long that's going to last, uh, difficult to see, you know, given what we're seeing now with COVID, with the second waves, um, but less activity. So you're seeing more, uh, probably deals obviously on the telecom and the energy side. And so hence probably, uh, all that drive powder chasing maybe fewer opportunities. Um, but at the same time, and that's where it's, it gets quite interesting. You actually see quite a lot of a uh, bilateral situation. So, you know, when we look at our, as investment and so some of the opportunities that we're looking at, we see uh, sellers more open to having these sorts of discussions. I think it's linked to maybe you know uncertainties on you know who has the capital and the ability to deliver in these times where we're still with a lot of uncertainties. Uh, so you're seeing a bit more of these uh, subjective elements that are I think quite important also when you're talking uh, about deal making. It's not only about you know putting a a price. It's also about you know delivering. When you're talking, you know, so partnering with corporates, you have to be there for the long run and the ability to structure this transaction. So I think it, you see a bit these two elements that go in diverging ways, um, which is a bit new to the to the period. So yes, you see some rebalancing, but maybe not the one that uh, everyone would have expected. Thank you, Jerome. Vincent. Yeah, I mean, on, on sellers and buyers market, I mean, I'm, I'm the first one to say, look, there is way too much equity and, and capital in infrastructure. I mean, if you think about it, you have about, you know, 200 billion of dry powder in, in funds. You probably can double that number with direct investors. So, you know, clearly a lot of a lot of capital out there, no question. You know, at the same time, as, as I was mentioning, we have done three deals this year. And interestingly, uh, to Jerome's point, two of the three deals were bilateral from, from start to finish. So the deal with Telefonica and the deal with Telecom Italia. Uh, and the third one was a process, very door, but a process that we that we preempted basically during the first phase of that process. So even in that environment where there is a ton of capital sitting on the sidelines, you know, we, we, we managed to do that. Now, why? Well, it's, it's quite simple. I mean, if you look at those three situations, they have a couple of things in common. Uh, a, they are very big, and I, I talked already about that. But also B, they are complex investment because all three of them were carved out from corporates. 
And two of the three were situations where the corporate didn't want to sell 100%, they actually wanted to look for a partner. Uh, and so if you put those very simple ingredients together, the size of those deals and, and the complexity of those deals, uh, you know, the reality, as I said, is you have barely any competition or nothing like that. And that was true. That was true five years ago. That's true today. That, that will still be true. Um, on monetizations, um, I mean, we, we are in a lucky position. We have, uh, you know, between the end of last year, the beginning of this year, we have sold, um, you know, everything that wasn't, you know, nailed to the wall. So we had, uh, uh, you know, five, six companies that we monetized in that time. Again, you know, we didn't see COVID coming, but we felt, you know, the market is so good, not going to get much better than that. And in all the investments where we had basically realized investment thesis, where we had little additional value add, you know, we felt we should just use that, that opportunity to get out. And so today we have a portfolio which is very, very young. Uh, you know, the, the, the oldest company we have, we invested it in, in 2017. Um, but, you know, to the point I made before, those are in sectors which we feel if we had to do something around those investments, we could still monetize them in a nice way because they are in sectors which in reality haven't really been impacted by this crisis. Thank you, Vincent. As we are running short of time, uh, I, I would suggest to quickly switch and conclude on the, on the third topic, uh, which is new investment that the current crisis may have triggered. Um, the current crisis has probably shed new light on some activities that we were undervaluing prior to the, to, to the lockdown. I will think about logistics, food sector, agro, education, drug production. Um, have you identified new sector that should deserve the, the, the infra gratification in, in the future? And for, for each of you, uh, is, it a new, is there a new sector that you would dream to add to your portfolio in the, in the, in the coming uh, months and years? Starting with you, Jerome. Yeah, look, you know, at ICG, you know, we focus, you know, on the on main three verticals, so energy, transport, uh, telecom, uh, with a focus on energy and telecom, as I mentioned. On, on, let's call it on social infra, I, I think, you know, we have been uh, uh, staying away from this uh, and a bit more prudent, maybe, uh, because, we, you know, we still consider, you know, when we look at dimension infrastructure, we need also hard assets, uh, you know, really have physical assets. So. So we have a bit stayed away. In terms of the new sectors, I think you know what will eventually be coming. Um, probably subsectors like uh, linked to electric, to mobility and electric vehicles uh, in particular. So it's probably at the, you know uh, the merger of a digital energy uh, transport uh, enshrined in you know in electric vehicles. So this is probably one uh, that will emerge uh, in the next few years. Uh, and also a theme linked to, to storage, uh, energy storage, batteries, well, I think will gradually, you know, as some of the European states are, are putting together capacity markets or, or reinvigor reinvigorating these markets. I think that's probably the, the two, you know, subsectors that we, we follow where we think, you know, things will move in the, in the short to medium term. Thank you, Jérôme. Angelica? Yes, yeah, so we don't really know a lot of time thinking about new sectors in the strict sense. I think that the the way we think about things is in terms of an infrastructure test, if you so will. And so we move across, you know, a, a fixed set of, of top of um, criteria. And no matter what we invest in, um, it will suit these criteria. So sometimes... If you start thinking about it that way, you might end up find it, finding it in quotation marks or investing into a sector that may surprise some people. But it's not a conscious effort to find new sectors. Thank you. Vincent, to conclude. Yeah, I mean, as I said, you know, part of the job is always to, you know, find kind of opportunities before others get quite aware of that. I would say the, the one thing we spend quite a bit of time on, we talked about energy transition quite a bit. Typically, people focus on, on renewable generation, they focus on transport. Uh, but the third vertical that you know, many people forget and don't focus on is everything that has to do with heating you know, for, for residential, for uh, industrial customers. 
you know, in many countries, heating is actually 50% of the greenhouse gas emissions. So that's the space, for example, on which we are uh, spending a lot of time right now. Thank you very much uh, to you three. I turn to Christina. We may have some questions for you. Uh, yes, definitely. People. Yes, definitely. Thank you very much to all of you. It's very interesting panel and insights. So let me give you a couple of questions. We actually, of course, have those questions that you can ask on the interactive uh, section. So let me start with a, a question for Angelica and or for Vincent. Our KKR has raised additional funds earlier this year. Antin has exceeded the six billion mark. We see funds at 15 billion dollars, hard cape and above, where is the limit? So maybe Angelica first? <laughs> okay, I think the limit is the, is the market really. Um, and uh, you know, when you raise funds, your, your strategy defines your market segment, defines the size of your market, defines the size of your funds. So, um, I do think that, you know, all things being equal, fund five, which will be the follow on fund, will be larger than six and a half billion. But for right now, we're very happy investing our fourth fund. Um, and then we'll see what the market does. Vincent, would you like to add something? Yeah, I mean, at KKR, we have quite a simple philosophy on those things. The, the limit is your ability to invest the money well. <laughs> Uh, and so in every situation, we will always ask ourselves not so much how much money is out there. Can I raise 15, 20, you know, 500 billion? The question is, you know, what am I comfortable investing in a way that is going to please my investors? Uh, because we know that you can not replicate that, that trick many times. Uh, clearly, there is a lot of appetite today. And uh, you know, because we have been expanding our investment horizon, we have been uh, growing the size of our funds as well. But we will do that in a prudent way in the future because you have each and every time to deliver performance that's it. we have another question about fiber will fiber actually be competing with 5g jerome maybe sure will it compete uh, we think both technologies are actually um, quite complementary um you now if you go a little bit into the details effectively you know especially when you're in urban centers. Uh, well, first, in order to get 5G, all the mobile towers will have to be fibered. Um, it's also a matter of how much you know, people use the same uh, bandwidth. And so you do need both technologies. Um, and when you look at it, actually, even in more rural areas, it, it, it can be actually that in a lot of cases, well, first, you probably don't need 5G everywhere anyway. Uh, and then fiber uh, is actually cheaper. Uh, in quite a lot of places, as opposed to installing all these uh, 5G antennas uh, everywhere. Another question for all of you. Where have you seen market correction and further pricing compression as a result of COVID? Vincent, Angelica? Yeah, I think we, we alluded to that. The main correction has been clearly in the transportation space. Um, and, and you see those assets still being heavily impacted today. I think if you look at, you know, and, and you take the public markets as a proxy, uh, and you look at what happened in March, April, you know, in the other sectors we have been describing, be, be it telecom, be it energy, uh, there has been a knee-jerk reaction in March, but then the correction um, or, or the bounce back has been, has been pretty clear. Uh, so that's today still the picture that we see in infrastructure. Another question, any views on the airport sector? Any exposure there from any of the panelists? I think we all plead non guilty on that one. <laughs> <laughs> like you. You'd like to add something, Jérôme? Yeah. Oh, no, I was also no. was seeing Vincent laugh, but yes, um, uh, no exposure. And uh, yeah, look, I'm not sure. Any, I, I don't have a crystal ball, you know. On but given what's happening with the, the second and she third waves, um, yeah, I would say it's going to get tough stuff for airports at least for another year. And then the big question is, you know, will people uh, adapt their needs? I think someone mentioned earlier that 
yeah, you know, travel is not essential. Uh, look, we're doing this conference now, um, you know, uh, thanks to fiber. So, you know, would people actually come uh, physically to the next one, even when airports are back on? Not so, not so sure. Well, I have another question for you, Jerome. Apparently, you're very popular here. You've analyzed uh, signs and closed an investment in the renewable space uh, right into the COVID crisis. Well done, actually, with first tangible impacts on some industry metrics. What are your long-term assumptions? Ah, <laughs> obviously, I can't disclose all that. <laughs> no, but more, more seriously, no. Look. <laughs> One thing we looked at in quite detail um, was indeed liquidity and to make sure that, you know, throughout uh, our investment period, liquidity will be there. And that means also in some refinancing assumptions, as most people know, you know, renewables, um, you can have long-term um, leverage. And so we're, we, we have been very prudent uh, from the perspective, probably more than we would have been six months ago, I have to say, uh, looking at rates, uh, looking also at quantums of debt that we would put on any individual uh, power plant. So I think, you know, when we look at it long term, that's the one thing that we, I think, where we have adapted to in a post-COVID world that yeah, potentially you know, the, the financing markets may not be open, you know, uh, in some windows and that we have to uh, adjust for that. Well, thank you very much to all of you. That was a great, a very interesting, actually, uh, panel. Uh, thank you also to our moderator. And uh, let's now uh, give you some information about what's next just uh, in a few uh, minutes. So we are going to have a, a next actually keynote uh, speaker that will talk about the role of natural gas assets in the transition from fossil fuel centric to low carbon energy and economic. This will be at 45. In the meantime, do not hesitate actually to check out the platform. You can also um, do some networking if you just connect to any participants that you'd like. And of course, check out the digital library, the panels on demand. Everything is really made on the platform. You do not have to leave the place. So see you there at 45 for our next keynote. Thank you.